Hello everyone and welcome to today's podcast of Hetuva the 2.0 and I'm your host Sharath. Uh last week ISRO has launched uh in the beginning of the new year as a new year gift to all of all Indians a new satellite uh into into orbit and uh, this satellite uh has this has a payload of two instruments which is going to study black holes. Can you imagine? So ISRO studying black holes now. Uh which is really a great news. uh because uh this is this is the first time uh that uh, that uh, that isro uh, is actually studying something other than uh, planets uh and and moon of course and other than earth really uh, to to be to be precise and uh, this these two instruments they are going to study black holes indirectly they are not going to observe black holes or take photos of black holes really but what they are going to do is that they are going to study the x rays uh you know the the radiation uh that's coming uh from the light and the radiation you know that that's coming from some of the brightest uh some some bright objects uh you know around i think 40 astronomical objects over a span of years so they're going to study uh the radiation that's coming from them and uh, they are fo- they're going to focus on uh, the x-ray spectrum uh, x-ray uh, frequencies x-ray wavelength spectrum of of, of this light so and they are going to actually study uh not just black holes and black holes i think they are going to only i mean they are going to point uh you know the satellite they are going to take it uh, take the radiation indeed coming from black holes but more important than, than that they are going to study uh you know the cosmic rays uh, you know the, the spectrum that's coming from cosmic rays and they are also going to study uh the x rays coming from other astronomical objects more importantly like uh, like neutron stars uh and pulsars pulsars are uh, neutron stars too and they are also going to study uh, the magnetic fields of uh, thing of you know objects like magnetars which are also neutron stars again so they are going to look at uh, the x-ray spectrum of some objects in the outer space and they are going to collect data based on that and this project is going to be going on for years together i think they are uh, giving about 5 years of project uh, lifetime for this for these two instruments and uh, these both of these two instruments their one is um, one is going to do the timing of of you know of the collection of of the of the observation and the other one is going to take the extra radiation and and start collecting data based on it and this is a this is a project that uh, that many astronomers uh, astrophysics based out of based in india and those who are working in the field of uh, uh, you know stellar evolution and then also in in cosmologists they are also excited about because this kind of data uh, this is i think this is like the second uh, till now uh, to study exclusive that a satellite and instruments that are uh, that are deployed to st- exclusively study x-ray spectrum so we had chandra x-ray telescope before uh, which actually produced uh, photos based on the data of from of 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 some pulsar stars of some neutron stars uh, you know these kind of deep uh, you know space astronomical objects and that really helped us understand uh physics uh especially with respect to gravity and as respe- and with respect to cosmology some parts of cosmology but most mostly astrophysics and uh stellar evolution and how stars die and uh, you know what ca- what we can expect by looking at dying stars or dead stars uh so this is isro's new mission and today we are going to talk about uh, uh also we are going to deal uh, dwell into what these black holes are and uh, how do stars die and what happens there so i'm going to share the link uh, to join the discussion uh, over streamyard in the youtube chat so you can join anytime <clears throat> and you can also ask any questions uh, you know related to physics related to astronomy related to stars uh so so then we can talk about them too okay all right the link is uh, provided the link in the youtube channel and you are free to uh join the discussion and uh, we already have some comments uh, so neeraj is saying hello hello neeraj thank you for tuning in and bliss of ignorance is saying they are waiting for it Okay, thank you for waiting, and now you can join. Okay. So, what are black holes really? I think most of us know about black holes 
from this movie interstellar where that is a black hole and this guy matthew mcconaughey he goes to this black hole and then he to stay young so he stays young while his daughter gets old uh, you know she gets aged uh, back back on earth uh, so i think this this is uh, the place where uh, most of us or many of us uh, came to know about something called a black hole and that's how the black hole looks like in the film uh, in fact actually that's a pretty accurate uh, portrayal of a black hole now obviously that's not a real black hole that's computer generated uh, but uh, that black hole uh, was actually generated using einstein's equations so we are going to talk about them uh, and how you can use them uh, to describe really a black hole there so as you can see what you see in that picture is that you know there is like a hole there's like a black thing in the center right uh, and then there is like a ring uh, of light that's surrounding it uh, you can see in the at the top at the bottom and also on the front so you see that there is like a disk of matter uh, of of radiation really and there is also this white ring that's inside it a uh, white ring of light that's inside the uh, black thing and there is like a center there right so that's how a black hole would look like and uh, this is kind of accurate but a more accurate version would be if this black hole was brighter on one side and dimmer on the other side that would be even more accurate but this is actually pretty good you know they even have a pa paper published um for the simulation uh, based on the simulation that was used to create this uh create this cg uh, this vfx so that was cool right really i mean sci-fi films uh, that are trying to portray uh, things that we don't know about that we can only imagine uh, or we can just look at the equations in a way that we can perceive through our eyes on film really so the actual black hole would look like something like this now this is the image uh, this is really the photo of a black hole uh, that was processed uh, based on uh, telescopic data and this black hole is called m87 so there there is a, there is a there is a galaxy called m87 uh, m87 star that's what it's really called and this black hole is uh, is a supermassive black hole that's at the center of that galaxy so this uh, this black hole is something like a millions of uh, it's i think it's like close to like 4 millions to 5 million of 4 to 4 and of million uh, solar masses so it weighs like what like 4 lakh times uh, that of the sun uh, which is really huge so this something like this is called a supermassive black hole uh, it's called smbh for short i mean they have acronyms for everything right <laughs> so this is how uh, it actually looks like uh, this is a photo that uh, that that came in 2019 that was released in 2019 uh, after like two years of processing of data uh, that we that of of images that we took of this black hole so this was done by uh, something called an even horizon telescope it's called eht you can look it up it's really cool uh, the project is really cool and uh, they had like telescopes that were spanning uh, over half of the globe and in, in, in towards the americas and the Mex and mexico and, and i think there is one in spain too and they took photos uh, you know at, at at an interval of like at, at the same instant you can say uh, and then they processed uh, the information from them from there and then this is generated from that so this is really a cool activity and then this was really wonderful right i mean black holes used to exist in films and music and other popular culture but now we have a photo so why are black holes such a big deal well uh, black holes are really a big deal uh, and the proof of that and, uh, and an illustration of that fact is that you know there was actually a nobel prize that was uh, awarded in 2020 uh, for for physicists who worked on black holes so if you look at it uh, there you know uh, three uh, scientists the physicists they actually got the black uh, Nobel Prize in Physics, uh, Roger Penrose, and uh, uh, and uh, Reinhard Genzel and Andrea Ghez. And uh, so Penrose was involved in uh, in the theoretical work of black holes, uh, that that he was able to use uh, general relativity uh, to show that you know indeed black holes uh, to describe the pro property of properties of black holes in great detail. And uh, he was not alone, uh, as you as you many of you might know, Stephen Hawking uh, was a collaborator. With Penrose, and they had uh, they had proved uh, something called uh, Hawking-Penrose theorems about black holes that actually uh, talked about properties of black holes in in uh, and then which pretty much uh, revoked uh, you know uh, recreated the interest in researching about black holes and also they also gave insights on how to identify them and so on. And unfortunately, Hawking was not alive uh, when uh, in 2020, so that's why he was not. Uh, part of the Nobel Prize. They don't give Nobel Prizes to dead people. So if Hawking were, you know, had been alive, he would have been included in the Nobel Prize as well. 
So Penrose, uh, his collaborator, received the Nobel Prize for this. And Genzel and Gez, uh, they two, both of them were uh, were also phys were also were astrophysicists who were involved in identifying uh, an object, as uh, you know, an astronomical object, as a black hole, as a supermassive black hole, to be exact. And the black hole, the photo of that black hole, uh, is is also in that slide there. You can see. So they identified, uh, they're based on calculations, based on existing observations of Milky Way galaxy. That's the galaxy in which, in which we live in. So Earth, the solar system is part of Milky Way galaxy. And uh, when, you, when, you, when you look at the center of the Milky Way galaxy, which is really hard to observe because it's, it's so deep and it's so tiny, but based on telescopic data and based on um, the movement around the center of the Milky Way galaxy, uh, they uh, did calculations and they established that there could be a supermassive black hole at the center of the Milky Way galaxy. And that is true, that turned out to be true. And uh, the same Event Horizon Telescope, which took the photo of the black hole M87 star, also took this picture of, uh, of, of the center of Milky Way galaxy. This is called Sagittarius uh, A star. So that's the name uh, that, that's given to this, uh, this, this the center of the Milky Way galaxy. And yeah, you can see that uh, there is a black hole, there is a black thing at the center, and there is like a disk around it. Right? So cool, right? So no, so th th this is the importance of black holes. That uh, there was a Nobel Prize that was also award, awarded uh, for for establishing that black holes do exist, and then identifying an, uh, an an actual object, an actual astronomical object as a black hole candidate. If you look at it, uh, black, the concept of black hole was around, has been around for some time, but they were not called black holes. Uh, they were not. Uh, thought in terms of black holes before, they were called something called dark stars. So if we look at, briefly, uh, if you look at the history of how uh, we understood an object of, uh, an object something like this could even exist, we, we should look at really 18th century there. And this was after Newton uh, gave his, uh, uh, his theory of gravitation. So when after that happened, so according to Newton, if you see uh, gravity is something is a force uh, that every massive particle, every particle that has mass, exerts upon uh, another particles. And uh, and the particles that have mass, they get influenced by gravity and they move because of this force of gravity. So that's how Newton looked at it. And after after Newton's gravity came uh, came out, at that time, the light was thought of, you know, consisting of particles. So it was thought there was this corpuscular, uh, corpuscular theory of light that was uh, mainstream then. Uh, so these, so light would be composed of particles that have mass. So uh, John Michel, uh, he uh, proposed that there could be uh, there could be stars that have that might exert gravity so big enough, so big. I mean, that would be so huge that light could not the particles of light uh, would be just uh, you know staying inside the star and they could not get out because of the gravity alone. So he called that a dark star. So if light can't escape from an object, so you would see that's like a dark star. So in fact, actually, what we understand today, black hole as a black hole is really a region of space or region of space time from where light or anything really cannot ex escape. Now, the, there, is a, there is a qualitative difference between uh, the concept of dark star and what we understand as black hole now. So according, to, so the way how Michel, Michel understood it was that uh, this particle uh, of this particle of light would not have enough energy to escape from the gravity of the star. So that's why light won't come out of it and that's why it would be dark. So he called it dark star. But uh, that, that, is, uh, that is that kind of explain, that explanation is actually wrong. Uh, we know it is wrong because if it is a massive particle, if this particle has mass, this light particle has mass, you can actually give energy from outside in some way so that it can escape gravity, right? If it is energetic enough, then it, can, uh, it, it has the uh, energy that's enough to overcome. Uh, you know, the potential that's created by the potential barrier that's created by the gravity of this massive star, right? Then it's not really a dark star. So that's that's why Michel is wrong. But the idea that there could there could exist an object from which, um, for which um, light cannot escape is, uh, was uh, an idea of interest. And then uh, along with Michel, at the same time, independently, Pierre Laplace, uh, he is also a pretty famous uh, physicist. He was uh, very crucial in the formulation of classical mechanics too, after Newton. So Laplace also uh, talked about uh, the same concept of dark star in one of his uh, books, uh, but later he removed it. 
because in 18th century or later on in 18th century and 19th century uh, light was thought of as wave rather than a particle because uh, scientists because their people have started observing the wave like properties of light like interference and diffraction uh, these are the properties that only waves have so light uh, so the particle theory of light pretty much took a back seat and that was thought to be wrong and so if light is a wave then waves don't have mass right only the particles uh, only uh, wave is like a disturbance right so so that's the reason uh, they thought that you know all right so it's not like you know gravity could uh, could actually you know make a, could could force a wave not to escape from it there is nothing like that so that's why that took a back seat and the concept of dark star was not really discussed much later on so before we move on we have a question from bliss of ignorance uh yeah, he's asking sorry for an offbeat question why would isro conduct a project on saraswati river i think this is a really good question um bliss of ignorance so isro does conduct uh, isro actually has a lot of uh, sat uh, it does has a, it does a lot of work on remote sensing and they actually try to map out the rivers river flows and then um, precipitation on earth and so on because they would help that would help with uh, with a lot of domestic uh, information you know creating something you know that's useful for a lot of citizens and that's actually the remote sensing satellites and then um, you know uh, this terrain uh, an, an, an analysis and assessment would be really helpful in many places too uh, so that's something isro does and uh, i think the saraswati river uh, well the uh, this is actually an area of interest even for archaeologists so whether uh, what really uh, if there was a river uh, i think it's um, it's near uh, i think i think there, there is a, there is there is like a tributary there is like a small river called kakra uh, right now i think if, if i'm not saying it wrong so that's that's part of the indus river so the there is a hypothesis that one of those uh, tributaries uh, could be uh, was what saraswati river from the past now now there is a there is a ongoing uh, you know line of investigation in from in in archaeology especially in the indus valley civilization archaeologists archaeologists are working on that that the decline of the indus valley civilization is usually is linked with the drying up of this river from the past and this is the river that's usually uh, associated with the saraswati river that's 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 mentioned in the rigveda and, and and other earlier vedas so what they want to find out if there was a river that existed before and if you could find traces of that river uh, you know on earth on on that region so i think that was the reason uh, isro would conduct this project so irrespective of what would what i mean irrespective of what uh, uh, you know any you know what the underlying reasons could be uh, information on this alone is actually an area of interest is would actually give us more data on uh, what happened on when if a river existed and the, i think the the chances are high that the river indeed existed there was there is some satellite data but it is not like uh, conclusive or something like that now uh, if if they really do this and we could get you know uh, much more data there then we would know whether uh, we, there was indeed a river that existed there or not and if it existed which areas were like the catchment for that so from there that would actually help uh, you know the uh, the iron uh, the, the copper the bronze and iron, early iron age, really you know the copper and bronze age india which is the indus valley civilization uh, we, that would help in gaining more insight into uh, into uh, what happened um, or a period of time and and any reasons for the decline uh, whether there was like desert, desertification that happened or whether it was like uh, how much how, mu how much droughts could have been there how many droughts uh, a period of drought could have been there back then and would that have impacted the civilization or not you know there is also a contention that uh, you know indus valley civilization should really be called the indus uh, saraswati uh, civilization because uh, most civilizations as you see are actually named after the rivers uh, they flourished on and uh, and only indus river uh, actually you know that's the only thing that we hear about indus valley civilization right so if saraswati is real was really a major river then that would actually take uh, give a direction to the uh, to the to the research too that was the reason all right hope that answered your question and uh, do uh, post your questions even on unrelated topics uh, anything anything that's related to science uh, you can you can ask them in the discussion and feel free to join the discussion too uh, you can talk as well right moving on so as we have seen 
in the initial idea of a dark star was actually proposed uh, was actually thought about something uh, sometime sometime in 18th century but nothing really happened after that but there was a round two that happened uh, in 20th century uh, that was when einstein uh, developed started developing general theory of relativity so he came up with uh, so he actually wrote about how space time uh, could be actually could could be curved uh, how space could be curved because of gravity so that was the idea from which the general theory of relativity started out so gender according so you can see there is a qualitative difference uh, between uh, newtonian gravity and general relativity so as we have seen in newtonian gravity gravity is more like a force uh, you know like 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 electromagnetic force like electric force or magnetic force that a uh, massive particles you know particles of mass would exert on other particles uh, and the and particles with with mass they would actually be influenced by this but general relativity takes a different approach to gravity it it describes gravity really in terms of geometry so gravity is nothing but you know curvature of space that's the idea in general relativity and uh, and things just move within in straight lines uh, in the shortest paths in this geometry and when the geometry is curved geometry itself is curved then it would mean if if you look from uh, from far away from that uh, perspective from that frame of reference really you would see that you know things are going around an object so that's how gravity would cause uh, you know things uh, massive particles to move in lines so it's it's like this you know because you know you can see the earth is a curved surface right and when you want to go from one place to another place you have to follow the curve on earth won't you you have to go through the surface if you are driving from one point to another point you can't just you know dig through the center of the earth or something like that if you are taking a road the road is curved then you look from outside the earth though it appears flat to you so this is the idea so, so for someone who is uh, looking from outside the earth uh, you would they would see people going in a curve you know from from one place to another place if you move from delhi if you go from delhi to chicago they would see you know that they actually took a curve even the air aeroplane and even the flight that would actually take a curved path uh, because it go it's going to fly around the you know uh, fly uh, you know above the ground and the ground is really curved has curvature so that's how we should look at gravity is what general relativity tells us so if so so according to this uh, general relativity so uh, the restriction that a part uh, you know, to be influenced by gravity, something should have a mass is actually gone away because now the path itself is curved. So if the road is itself here has bends, there is no other way for, uh, for anything uh, other than to take the bends, right? So that is the reason now light uh, can also get influenced uh, by gravity. And uh, we do have a caller, uh, uh, you know, in the pipeline, but uh, before we take them, let me just finish this uh, on this point. So what happened uh, when Einstein developed general relativity, he started lecturing, he started, you know, uh, talking about this, he started giving out his equations uh, to, uh, you know, to, to, to researchers in the, in the area and then also to, you know, physicists uh, in general. So what Einstein's equations give us is that they tell us how a configuration of matter, matter, energy, momentum, stress, energy, so combination of these things, how a configuration of this would curve space-time around it would carve space around it so that is the, that is essentially what einstein's field equations do and they also tell about how in a particular configure in a geometry of space in a curved geometry of space or any geometry of space uh, uh you know uh, the particles would move around it matter would move around it so these are the two things that essentially einstein equations give us now these are really complex equations <clears throat> i mean if you look at the einstein field equations field equation uh, you can look it up online and uh, so einstein's field equations are really short if you look at it and that's because einstein's einstein used a really brilliant notation uh, that's the reason they they appear so uh, condensed but if you actually start solving uh, uh, einstein's field equations they like blow up uh, like like, uh, like 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 anything so it's really complex math but it's not that difficult to follow if you understand uh, uh, you know like you know tensor calculus and all that However, uh, so what Einstein, Einstein himself was surprised at the complexity of these equations and what they were actually leading into. So he was uh, focused on actually not deriving exact solutions because these are really difficult. They are not like linear equations. So that is the, is the reason these equations are difficult to solve. Um, 
So he started giving out approximate solutions for many of the configurations that they have. And he was showing that, you know, indeed, if you take like a configuration like a star, uh, the space time around it, the easy equations uh, would actually give a space time space that's curved, you know, in elliptical orbits around it. So that's the reason planets move, uh, you know, around stars in elliptical orbits and so on. So he was giving these kind of approximations. He was giving, he was uh, giving approximations, uh, you know, calculations on how you know light of a star would bend and so on behind a massive object like a star and such. However, the guy on the left, uh, Schwarz, uh, Schwarzschild, Karl Schwarzschild, he was the first guy to give uh, an exact solution for Einstein's equations, and he actually proposed and his his solution uh, uh, of space time involved um, a star. And uh, after a star, and based on the density, I know how much matter is there in this star, in, is, is in, this, in, this, in this region of space time. He proposed that there is a there is a there is a region, you know, there is a boundary inside which light cannot escape. So if if anything comes in inside, so it's not just light cannot escape, but the space is so warped that it would already that it would always you know go into the into the object itself rather than coming out. So there you have a, a candidate. Uh, you know, a theoretical description of a region of space that from which light cannot escape. Light, it's not just light. Anything cannot escape from which geometry just warps inside into it. So nothing can really go out. Even if something is, is just going and then it's, even if it gains energy, it'll just keep going faster within the same curved space time, which is really curving into it, into the object rather than coming out or going around it. So he was the first guy to propose the solution. However, Einstein was very skeptical about it. So Einstein uh, wanted to disprove <laughs> Schwarz, uh, Schwarzschild. Uh, but however, Einstein later realized that uh, his, his calculations were in, indeed correct. Schwarzschild's calculations were indeed correct. Unfortunately, Schwarzschild died at an early age. He died like a year after he published his uh, Schwarzschild uh, solution, which is really famous now. So now this, the, this boundary, uh, whatever we talked about, from uh, un, inside which uh, light, anything, nothing can escape from a black hole, from, from this stellar object, is now actually called the Schwarzschild radius. You know, it's named after him. However, he died a year after, a, uh, before a year uh, after he published it uh, due to some autoimmune disease. And uh, so Einstein was able to prove that, you know, Schwarzschild was indeed correct later on. However, unfortunately, he was not alive uh, to see all that happen. All right, we have uh, talk rationally in the Q pipeline and we are taking uh, them onto the stage. Uh, hello, this is uh, hello Govind Garu from Talk Rationally. How are you? Hello, hi, I'm good, uh, Sharit Garu. Uh, thank you. It's very interesting uh, topic. I have one question. Uh, I always have this question, uh, and I think you partially answered that one just now. The Schwarzschild uh, uh, prediction, uh, whatever he expected. See, if you look at the picture of the black hole, uh, you see that uh, for me. We all understand that uh, space time is like a fabric, correct? It's like a fabric, uh, can, some kind of a framework or a mesh wire kind of a thing stretched across it. On top of it, uh, assume that these uh, planets and stars exist. A black hole is there in the center of that uh, space time fabric. If you look at from the top view, it should look like a ring, correct? A black hole, and around that, uh, there's a light. And then there is an event horizon that uh, nothing can escape beyond that line. So why would why would why we see two rings like uh, like Saturn? See in between there is a ball of a ring, and around that there is another ring is there. I think uh, it is so so curved so that light cannot escape, and it, it looks like light is going inside that uh, uh, black hole itself. That visually it looks like two rings. So the how they predicted that kind of a, even in the movie, um, uh, Interstellar, as well as the real picture, there are two rings. See, one is towards us, one is on the top. There are two. Is it a light ring itself, or it's it just like a tube kind of a light, or it's just like a speed of light? That, that's a really good question, uh, uh, going there. So if you look at this uh, simulation of a black hole, this is pretty accurate, actually. So you would see, and apparently it appears as if there is a ring this way, you know, which may be going uh, behind as well, like Saturn. And there is this other ring, you know, that, that's just, you know, around, uh, in, in, in it's like perpendicular to this ring, right? The, yeah. When we look from outside. However, this ring, this, this ring really doesn't exist. So this ring, what we see here, this and this, 
is just you know the the part that is behind this so it's just only one disk it's called the accretion disk however the space around the black hole is so warped so when we look from the other side so the uh, so it's bent uh, so much because of the curvature so whatever there is on the behind that actually appears uh, in this way because the light that goes this way that it actually come uh, you know to, to towards you this way and then this is the same part that actually also appears uh, you know from from below so this and this the the top you know these two semicircles are actually the same same piece so i think in interstellar they also show the movement of the you know light here uh, in within the accretion disk so the light ray that actually goes like this and goes behind and then it actually comes like this so i think i think there is a there are some shots that show the flow you know i mean that that actually capture you know how the light is really traveling there so it's really wonderful i mean we don't see this kind of space uh, this level of warped space time where the back of the black hole is what we see on the top and the bottom so oh, okay yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay, good so that's uh, how it is yeah thank you and second question is that uh, life cannot cannot exist at the black hole correct like life there's no life at the center of the, at the sun and there's no no life in uh, black hole like uh, nothing can exist the matter itself uh, disappears when it goes there uh in that case in most of the science fiction movies it they show that uh, the people travel towards the black hole they fall into the black hole and they appear somewhere else in some kind of a deluge some kind of a world dungeon world some kind of a thing and then uh, that is pure science fiction uh, thing but uh, life cannot exist the moment anything enters there is the end of the life correct uh yeah that is true uh, well uh, i mean life cannot exist on sun but life does exist uh, like millions of kilometers outside sun right i mean we we are here on earth i know in the so, black center of the black hole it is extreme no, no, of, gravity of course no Be- because yeah. it's so dense and even yeah, in stars so i mean they are usually so hot so dna i mean life like you know dna based life it cannot exist i mean uh, chemistry doesn't really happen Uh, at those energy levels uh, it, because things would just uh, i mean rip apart would... rip apart for example no, the bonds exactly, yeah. any 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 chemical bondings or anything it rips it rips apart the yes, cannot exactly bond i mean it would rip apart and then it would get ripped apart and actually if if anything that actually goes near a star really even if you look at the surface of the sun it's so hot that you know matter exists in a state called plasma so that's the that's what it is called so if 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 any particles that are thrown inside uh, towards a star they would actually uh, you know go into the plasma state which are really high energy uh, they are really like you know very uh, very fast and so on so that's the same thing with black hole as well so uh, now 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 the gravitational effects of a black hole outside it outside its event horizon and at a distance you know at at like a large distance would be the same as you know uh, how uh, the gravitational effects of a star with the same mass would be so say, say for example uh, tomorrow if if you know sometime if you just replace the sun with a black hole with the same mass but this black hole would be like i think like 10 kilometers wide or something like that i think even even less than that sorry i think for the sun uh, the same mass of the sun to be compressed into a black hole it will be very dense i think it will be like a kilometer or something like that not more than that and so even if you replace it with a black hole at the distance of the earth nothing really would change the earth would still continue going around it but it's just that we won't get any radiation from it like we are getting it from the sun so that would be the only difference there so at a distance uh, from a black hole you could treat it uh, as as like any uh, star uh, that has the same amount of mass so in that way you could yeah i mean uh, it's there's nothing impossible for uh, life on planets on uh, you know uh, revolving around a, a black hole at a distance uh, to exist but however as as someone ke- approaches a black hole uh because of the warped uh, space time the a lot of you know uh, the, the there could be a lot of like tons of tidal forces you know this force and this way and then you know that would just <laughs> that would just rip apart any any form of uh, you know structure that's there uh, in, due to the chemical reactions or biochemical reactions in any matter say for example if this guy uh, there is a scene in interstellar where uh, matthew mcconaughey he just falls into the black hole and then from there he just enters a uh, enters a region uh, like a, 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 he becomes like a four dimensional being you know after going into the black hole uh, so this four dimensional being uh, he becomes he can just you know go through time as well you know across across regions of space just like how we can move go from new york to san francisco he can go from today to like 10 years before uh, by moving across space so that is obviously a fantasy and there is nothing science about that 
any anyone i think uh, i think once you start approaching a human being uh, like 5 feet or 6 feet uh, starts approaching a black hole uh, the difference between the gravity uh, you know uh, on on their feet versus their head would be so strong would be so huge that they would just get ripped apart because of the tidal forces there so that happens even with sun if people like approach too close to the sun then whatever gets approached as long as you know the gravitational force uh, i mean the gravity uh, not should not say force the gravity if the, the difference between the gravity between uh, from from one part of the body to another part of body is so huge that uh, that you know this would be pulled faster than this catches up uh, because of its elasticity if that happens then that this part would not catch up but this part would just get ripped off so so it would lose its elasticity it would lose its tensile strength and it will just break apart so that's what's going to happen if we approach uh, objects that are real that have like uh, that are, that that fr- around which uh, you know the potential is so huge and then uh, the gravitational potential is so huge okay yeah thank you sir 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 uh, those are my questions you can take uh, other callers uh thanks going there thanks for calling okay so all right let's move on to round 3 so now after schwarzschild has show as a uh, provided uh, a solution an exact solution to general relativity that was not there was uh, that was not the complete picture really because um uh, general relativity uh, as we can see is not a quantum theory in the sense that when you start uh, looking at things that are microscopic uh, after after some after a level after a level of uh, distances and if you look at uh, uh, things that uh, that that are also pretty energetic that have like huge amount of energy and that are confined within like a uh, within short distances then you would not really see uh, the full picture unless you add quantum mechanics to it unless you look at the effects uh, the quantum effects uh, arising from that kind of configuration so that was something uh, that was done by by subramanian chandrashekar so after schwarzschild uh, gave out his theory and uh, gave out his equations and then gave out his solution and after einstein also confirmed uh, these things there was still the uh, there was still uh, the question of what what would really happen uh, whether why would really this space would just collapse upon itself uh, i mean if if anything can really happen i mean if, if if even if you start with a star or anything of any amount of mass would that really get compressed uh, into a black hole or not so that question was really answered by subramanian chandrashekar and uh, he actually got a nobel prize uh, not for that work really but but for stellar evolution later on but but what but but what what work he did on black holes is actually part of his uh, uh his general work on astrophysics as well so what chandrashekar did was he gave a calculation he did some calculations and then he proposed that there is a limit on the mass and if if a star starts out at this limit at this mass then it would then it would it would not stop at a stage and it would just keep proceeding further so this this mass called chandrashekar limit uh, it's 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 something like roughly one and a half times of uh, mass of sun so i think if if a star starts out with that amount of mass then uh, we'll talk about how uh, stellar evolution works uh, but if it starts at that uh, of you know uh, higher than that mass then it would not stop at the stage what some what is called the white dwarf it would keep going on it would keep uh, you know getting compressed further and further so that was the limit uh, that was a calculation he worked out and he came with that calculation and he figured out that by applying uh, you know quantum mechanical effects to what happens when matter in star gets compressed so we'll talk about the details of that and later on uh, the same calculations were uh, actually taken forward and also were confirmed and uh, the further evolution was also actually published by this guy oppenheimer i mean that's not the actual picture that's from the film but yeah you get the picture so oppenheimer was also instrumental in in this uh, research of uh, of giving of putting quantum mechanics along with uh, this black hole physics so what really happens here i mean when you take the picture from general relativity and quantum mechanics what really happens is that if you look at a star a star is exists uh, i mean a star maintains its structure because of two things so there is like an equilibrium that happens there is like a balance between the gravity that's pushing it inside uh, into the core of the star 
and this gravity is because of the mass of the matter that from which the star is built so this is usually for for, for a star that is glowing bright it's usually the hydrogen the helium uh, because you know hydrogen gets fused into helium and and also in some parts of the star in the in the central regions of the star you can also see some you know uh, some higher elements uh, elements in the you know in the period uh, some higher uh, elements uh, you know like carbon oxygen nitrogen all these things are really present in, in in our sun as well so there is this gravity that's big that's compressing it uh, towards the center and uh, but however there is also uh, because of the nuclear uh, reactions that are happening inside the star, especially at the center of the star, where uh, a lot of nuclear reactions do happen because of pressure. There is also this radiation that is coming out. Uh, that is a radiation from light that is actually escaped from it, escaping from it. You do see, you know, sun radiating a lot of heat from us. So that radiation actually has a pressure inside it. So this this is the balance. Uh, this is the this is called the equilibrium. This is called the hydrostatic equilibrium, uh, in which a star actually is able to maintain its structure. So there is this gravity compressing in, but there is this, uh, you know, radiation pressure that's going out. And because of that, the star uh, is in a balance. So the size of a star is really determined uh, by how these two things are. And however, the nuclear reactions don't happen for, 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 in, for infinite amount of time. You know, fuel is finite. Resources are finite. And that's a fact of life. That's a fact in physics. That's a fact in economics. That's fact everywhere. So because of the finite amount of hydrogen uh, that it can, that, that nuclear reactions can uh, can happen uh, for which uh, and after the hydrogen is all burnt up then there are other nuclear reactions that can also happen there are these carbon nitrogen oxygen kind of uh, you know nuclear fusion reactions that can also happen but there's a limit to that so after a certain point of time uh, nuclear reactions will just stop happening and when that happens you can see you know the outward radiation pressure is actually decreased so now what happens is the star will try to will start collapsing so when it starts collapsing, initially there would be some sort of expansion because the outer layers of the star, the outer regions of the star, uh, they would that material would be just blown off. And when that happens, this star undergoes an expansion. Uh, I mean, when we look from outside, the size of the star increases, and that's called a red giant. And after that phase has passed, what we would see is that you know the core of the star uh, that remains, and that is called a white dwarf. So Chandrasekhar limit is the limit at which, at the mass at which uh, a white dwarf would, a star would actually stop at a white dwarf stage and not move further. And beyond this limit, if a star starts out with a mass higher than this limit, then the white dwarf, it, then it will not stop at white dwarf, but it will, steep, it will evolve further. So the lifetime will go evolve further. So before we talk about what happens later on, we have uh, two questions from Sandeep. So Sandeep asks, one can't go into black hole like they showed in Interstellar. Uh, yes, that's right. They can't go back into, they can't go into a black hole because even as we approach, as a human being at least, you know, approaches a black hole, uh, they will get uh, ripped off. And this is called spaghettification. You know, human being would, would get squished like a, like spaghetti, spaghetti pasta. So that's, uh, that's the funny name that they gave to it. But yeah, even if you throw a rocket, even if you throw the strongest material that we can think of, uh, that would just uh, be, you know, uh, be split into uh, into 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 its uh, into into like you know the the particles of the matter that 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 can you know uh, that will be split into uh, like you know fundamental particles or even you know uh, like subatomic particles that that's what it would turn into and it would actually be so hot uh, that you know it would it would be in a plasma state rather than anything that's uh, really that can really do any job for us so that's how uh, things near black hole would be and. Uh, Sandeep also asks that how how true is the same with wormholes that claims to provide shortcuts between different points of space or portals to another other dimensions or universes. Now this is a really interesting question because when um, as we have seen uh, seen that you know Schwarzschild he actually provided a solution for a black hole right in uh, a configuration of space time from which light cannot escape. Now you can actually extend that solution and you can think of uh, like a series of black holes which connect. Uh, you know, regions of space-time. And there are some, and when Einstein um, actually, you know, went through the solution and he started solving uh, for some regions of space-time, he indeed came with a solution of space-time where, um, where, you know, things can only go out but never go in. So a black hole is some, as a region of space, as we have seen, uh, that is in which space is warped in a way that things can only go in. So all paths actually, they lead into the black hole and no path actually comes out of the black hole. So the opposite of this is what a wormhole is. 
a wormhole is a, is is a place where all paths you know uh, in in this object for this for this configuration of space they are, they always lead away out of you know the region they never go, nothing no no region uh, uh, you know actually goes into it so even if something tries going into it it will eventually come out so those are the space curves uh, if you, you know that, that 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 how the space looks uh, around this object so that's and wormholes do exist uh, in relativity as geometrical artifacts but we don't know any candidates uh, any astronomical candidates uh, that that natural candidates you know that that have processes in nature that are actually produce wormholes so that's where uh, we are at wormholes are so i think we saw wormholes uh, we have a wormhole in interstellar we see wormholes in the marvel films as well uh, in that film um, thor ragnarok uh, there is a there is a wormhole it's called an einstein rosen bridge that's uh, that's it's also called as an einstein rosen bridge but yeah that's what wormhole is and um, there is an interesting thing uh, about a wormhole so if you look at um, if you look at the big bang i mean if you look at our universe our universe is actually going i mean things are actually going away from each other right uh, that's what we see as an expansion uh, of space uh, after big bang and big bang really was a singularity in the sense that you know uh, there was uh, yeah it was like a singularity and we'll talk about what it is uh, so that's a place where things become so dense that uh, you know that I, the general relativity equations they go i mean they just blow up they just blow off so uh, so from singularity we see that you know the universe started expanding so and it's not like you know you can go back to the singularity at any uh, even if you try doing that i mean the universe won't go back there so there is an idea that the universe itself might be like an example of a wormhole but that's a very far fetched idea uh but yeah that's how wormholes are so wormhole is something from in uh, in which the space around it the space the space configuration space time configuration always leads outside but we don't have any natural candidates for black holes yet so what happens after a star becomes a white dwarf once that happens then uh, depending so what what really keeps the white dwarf stable then because you know there is no radiation pressure that's coming outside right however when you apply quantum effects when you look at what happens really to the electrons and the and the protons and the neutrons uh, that are that exist in this white dwarf because all these uh, you know the uh, you know the the all these you know uh, subatomic particles the protons neutrons and electrons they actually come because of uh, you know the nuclear reactions that happen uh, so because of that what happens is that um, now there is something called degeneracy pressure in quantum mechanics so the thing is essentially if you don't apply quantum mechanics what happens is that the electrons that are inside you know the white dwarf they would eventually you know collapse into uh, the positive charges and then they they would essentially collapse into the core however that's not really what happens when you when you take quantum effects into consideration so in quantum in quantum mechanics we have something called the uncertainty principle um, so from which you know you can you, you you if if what it really means is that if you know that you know that that a particle is confined to a position then it can't uh, then the amount of energy that it has or the amount of momentum amount of the motion it has cannot be restricted to the same level so it you can't arbitrarily choose the position of a particle uh, the range of position of a particle the uncertainty in the position of a particle and the uncertainty in the motion so when you when you when you just you know keep narrowing down the position of a particle uh, within a region you 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 should be expecting the momentum uh, to have a range of values so you so this is how it becomes so which means that you can't say that you know all electrons will simply you know collapse into the core because then you are really confining the position there right i mean you are narrowing down the position so you don't know what's really going to happen what are the speeds really because the speeds is speed is what going to you know decide where it really goes right so what happens because of this is that we end up with something called Pauli exclusion principle. This was uh, proposed by Pauli. I think some of us might have, many of us might have, might remember this from our chemistry uh, in high school. So according to this, two electrons cannot occupy the same state. That's what it means. So because of that, uh, the electrons would actually have some amount of energy uh, inside a white dwarf, and because of that, there is a degeneracy pressure. That's the pressure that's exerted outwards. That's called a degeneracy pressure, and that's what keeps this white dwarf stable. Uh, however if the star has is more massive if it's beyond uh, that mass i think it's about uh, 4 to 10 
no, no, I think it's about like 10 to 25 times of solar mass or something. I think that's the limit. Uh, then it becomes something called a neutron star. Evolve, it evolves into this stage called the neutron star. So in a neutron star, what happens really is that the electrons, they can't really maintain the degeneracy pressure. They get actually injected into protons and neutrons get formed. However, uh, the neutrons are big enough to have to form the degeneracy, degeneracy pressure here. So the a neutron star would actually be stable. It won't uh, really you know, evolve into, evolve further into a black hole, uh, really. Because it has, because it it is again under uh, the degeneracy equilibrium. It is under again equilibrium because of the neutron degeneracy pressure. So that's what a neutron star is. Now our ISRO, um, uh, uh, you know, the payloads, the instruments that ISRO has sent, is going to mainly study uh, the radiation that's coming from white dwarfs and neutron stars. So among neutron stars, we have like class of astronomical objects called pulsars, which like emit uh, radiation. This is usually uh, you know, extra radiation in a very specific periods of time. I mean, this the the pulsars some the pulsars the the timing of the pulsars radiation is so precise that back in the 80s, I think, uh, when when astronomers started observing these pulsars, the radiation coming from pulsars, they could not understand that it is actually coming from a natural astronomical source. There some uh, there was a project in which they thought that aliens were communicating with us because the signals were so periodic that would appear as if you know someone intelligent as us uh, might be sending it to communicate uh, uh, sending it to communicate with with other species in the galaxy but later on it was found out that it was actually coming from a pulsar uh, and uh, they even called the signal as uh, lgm little green men <laughs> they thought it was aliens but it was not i mean this was not seriously taken but some of them uh, they considered this possibility that it was might be coming from uh, some extraterrestrial intelligence but it was not it was coming from an astronomical object then these are pulsars so among neutron stars we have pulsars and we also have something called magnetars so magnetars are uh, again yeah, they're also neutron, neutron stars but it's just that the you know the radiation signature is a bit different so magnetars actually have a very powerful magnetic field around them and so our isros um, pale uh, instruments both of them they are going to study white dwarfs and they are also going to study uh, the neutron stars, really the radiation coming from them. Uh, so, and when a neutron star is actually more massive uh, than like what I think, like 20 times of, or 40 times of, um, there's a range in which these things can happen. Uh, if it's more, if it starts out with mass more than that, then more than this limit, then it actually collapses further. So the neutron degeneracy pressure won't be enough uh, to counter the gravitational collapse. And that actually will eventually lead to a black hole. So that's what we, uh, that's how a life of star would be. So it would eventually become a black hole in this way, if, if it has enough mass. But why is it important? I mean, we, we saw this all stellar evolution and things, how they uh, go into become black holes and stars, how they become white dwarfs. And from there, uh, they, they end up becoming neutron stars. And eventually some of them would collapse into black holes. And, uh, you know, if there is like mass, there could also be supermassive black holes. But what's the point? I mean, why do we really need all that? So maybe I'll just uh, I'll just expand the slide a bit so you can see it uh, well uh, uh, better. Well, these stars, these uh, exotic objects uh, in universe, they may not be really be exotic. There, there could be many of them, uh, but it is in these places where all the elements of uh, you know of nature are forged, really, because whatever elements that we see on Earth today. Uh, or whatever we see in uh, any anywhere in, in any planet, they were forged in a star, in a dying star. That's what it is. Now, if you look at this, I think you would recognize this. Um, if if you if you watch Breaking Bad, you might be familiar with some of this. <laughs> so, uh, so this is a periodic table of elements, and these these there are actually all the elements that we see in nature. Uh, all we have observed till now. Uh, there could be more elements. We don't know, uh, but there could be like uh, uh, above ninety-two or so. They could be very, uh, and those elements might not really be stable. They could just, you know, uh, they could just, you know, uh, be split into other elements because of nuclear processes, uh, nuclear forces. And so, and they might not really be, really be stable, you know, in, in human timelines. But if you look at it, uh, there are like various ways in which the elements get forged. You can see that the blue ones, uh, the ones that are, you know, colored in blue, they form, uh, they were formed really because of what happened immediately after Big Bang. Immediately in the sense that, you know, maybe 
perhaps like four lakh years after Big Bang because of that process. It's called Big Bang nucleosynthesis. That process is called. So if you see, most of that is like hydrogen, helium, and a little bit of lithium. Only these three elements would be uh, would be really formed uh, because of uh, from Big Bang nucleosynthesis. So this is why you know most of uh, most of the matter in in the universe is hydrogen, helium, and lithium. Lithium is very very trace amount. It's mostly hydrogen and and some helium. And that's why we see stars. It's not a coincidence. Stars are composed of hydrogen. Yeah. And uh, and a lot of other elements, you can see the ones in green, they are formed when massive stars explode because of the force, you know, because of the pressures there, uh, new elements get forged because of nuclear reactions. So, you know, you know what? I mean, new, forging new elements is not a chemical process. People thought it would be a chemical process before. Uh, for example, you know, people like Newton, even Newton actually wrote a great deal about alchemy, something called alchemy, in which you would take one element, like go, uh, like, you know, maybe like lead, and then maybe like iron or lead or copper, and you would do some chaska maska with it, and you end up with gold. So people did not think, they did not realize, and they were, uh, that, you know, this, the energy that you can, that, that in which chemical reactions happen is not sufficient enough uh, to forge new elements. We did not, they did not know about that back then. So that's why uh, Newton wrote a great deal about alchemy and how, you know, you can produce, uh, how the ways uh, in which you can think of, you know, turning one metal into another metal. But that does not happen anywhere on earth. The only stuff like that happens in dying stars. So as you can see, the, uh, the ones that are colored in green, uh, they are, uh, you know, forged uh, when, when stars are actually, you know, exploding. And a lot of elements are there, you can see, you know. Uh, and, and other than that, you can also see that uh, the ones that are marked in orange are uh, they are forged when neutron stars get merged. So when these big neutron stars, you know, when they are held by uh, you know degeneracy pressures, uh, a lot of stars are actually exist in binary systems. Though, so they are actually gravitationally coupled. You know, they uh, these neutron stars they do merge, and uh, when they merge, a lot of things happen. That's like a that's like a that's like a un that's like a Catalyst uh, that like you know catalytic event at, at at stellar or universal scales you know uh, there is something called you know gravitational waves that are also released from this process and we have actually detected them uh, there was a gravitational wave sensor we actually detected merging of two big neutron stars that happened like like well, like a million like, like billions of years ago or something like that so when neutron stars merge then they in that process they actually forge a lot of elements. So you see, you know, all those elements, the gold, silver, everything, all these, all these precious metals that you see, they were formed when neutron stars were merging. And there are also other elements, you know, that, that, uh, that actually produced when, when your cosmic rays, they actually, you know, uh, they just, you know, Im impact each other. So when, whenever that happens, uh, it's fission, cosmic ray fission, when, when particles in cosmic rays, because they are like very high energetic, they, they travel like close to speed of light, when that happens, uh, some elements, they actually, nuclear fission uh, can happen inside uh, the, the cosmic rays, the matter inside the cosmic rays, and that would be like a couple of elements too. But you can see that all the elements that we see, uh, most of them are actually exist because stars die. So if you, if you made uh, uh, someone happy by buying them gold, uh, be happy, you know, you should thank two neutron stars that actually merged in distant past. So that's how that's, that's the deal with life. Now, this is not the end of, uh, of, of what we understand about black holes because after, uh, you know, the astrophysics around black holes was uh, about uh, that work was done by, uh, by Subramanian Chandrasekhar and others, um, they, the description uh, with respect to uh, the, some type of quantum effects with general relativity was and some properties some definitive properties of black holes were really uh, established by these two guys. Uh, this was Stephen Hawking and Roger Penrose. And we have seen Penrose got, was uh, given, was awarded a Nobel for his work too. So what they really did was they showed, uh, they talked about, they, I mean, they proved some theorems on how the inside of a black hole would look like. Look like in the sense how the geometry of space inside the uh, black hole would, would be. And they showed that uh, pretty much all paths, they would actually, uh, they would actually, uh, converge into the center of a black hole. That's called a singularity. That's what a singularity is. And at this singularity, uh, the equations of general relativity, they just go to infinities. I mean, they just break down. Uh, but that doesn't mean that 
there is really like you know infinity or you know infinite amount of density or infinite amount of pressure at the center of a black hole because infinite is 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 a mathematical construct it's not a real thing so there could be high but what happens there would really uh, we would know it when we when we understand how gravity affects uh, things at a quantum levels so we don't have a theory of that yet we don't have this theory of quantum gravity yet there are some approaches uh, there is that that's, that's like an active area of research to some extent but uh, we don't know what happens at the center of the black hole yet because we don't have a theory for it it's not just nature hides it from us there is no uh, thing like that uh, as uh, from now it's just the general relativity is not enough to describe this just like how newtonian mechanics is not enough to describe something like a dark star uh, it's not enough because given what we know about electromagnetism given what we know about light the wave nature of light uh, it's it's uh, the theory is not sufficient so general th relativity in the same way is not sufficient to describe uh, singularities and the same kind of singularities would exist were there was there at the beginning of the universe too so as we see the big bang expansion it's really an expansion at the big bang uh, that actually started off from a point from a point in time uh, which is like from where there is which is in which the universe uh, was in a very high dense state very hot and dense so it had like high temperature and high density and at that place at the point of time uh, you know our general relativity is not sufficient the equations break down so we would need a quantum theory of gravity to explain all that and uh, so these were called the black hole uh, these were called the singularity theorems of stephen hawking and roger penrose now recently uh, there was there was a proof that was actually put forward uh, uh, i forgot the name of the mathematician but it's a pretty famous guy so the, he actually showed that the proof that they uh, hawking and penrose gave is not entirely correct but that doesn't mean the conclusions would be wrong there is no reason to uh, there is no reason not to think uh, that uh, there would be a singularity at the center of the black hole uh, but the proof looks like what they have given uh, the mathematical proof that's not entirely so strong maybe i think there are there will be some other proofs uh, that will be coming in future too but as far as we know the black hole does have a singularity uh, in in its center now as we have talked about i mean we talked about we call these things uh, black holes and dark stars but even at this stage i think uh, until uh, uh, till a long period of time even in einstein's time this was not really called a black hole it was called a dark star and it was just you know this region of space from which nothing can escape but this guy john wheeler he was also pretty instrumental in um, uh, in 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 the, in the black hole physics and he was also an astrophysicist too and uh, he actually coined this word called black hole and he was also the guy who coined the word wormhole so <laughs> he names things <laughs> and he, there are a lot of holes in the sky uh, which he named so he named black holes he named worm holes uh, he actually popularized uh, many of these things in the general public too so ultimately the name black hole was given by john archibald wheeler so if you look at it as we have seen uh, this was the picture of the black hole that we uh, that we said you know uh, that we have taken uh, that m87 star that was taken by the event horizon telescope and this was a wonderful activity uh, astronomical achievement that we really did uh, because who would imagine that we could you know uh, go, we could look at the center of our galaxy of the, the milky way galaxy or you know center of this other galaxy uh, m87 and then and then be able to photograph uh, the black hole the supermassive black hole that's at the center of it so this is not like a stellar black hole this is not a black hole that was formed when a star collapsed this is black hole uh, that that was formed when like you know when when stars actually came together because of gravitation gravity and then they just collapsed into one another so this is called a supermassive black hole and this has like a millions of uh, uh, solar mass uh, that, that's that's how huge this thing is and black holes are extremely difficult to detect and uh, these supermassive black holes are something that we were able to uh, you know generate images based on uh, our telescopic uh, data so what it means for isro is that uh, we are excitingly looking at the radiation that's going to that's coming from uh, this like 40 to 50 uh, i think it's like around 40 astronomical objects uh, the candidates that it's going to look at uh, in 5 years in the next 5 years to analyze to look at the radiation collect data from that and then and then understand the magnetic properties around it and so on so if you look at this photo you see these streaks of light right on the right side on the right uh, in the right uh, the, uh, right uh, fourth quadrant of the picture there 
And this actually this picture is actually uh, processed in polarized light. So that would and doing that would actually give us uh, the details of the magnetic fields, uh, you know, uh, of the radiation that's coming uh, from the black from this source. So this polarized uh, uh, looking through, uh, you know, I mean, polar looking through the polarized light, uh, you know, that uh, from a source would help us understand that. And that would just remove, you know, effects of interference uh, and such like that from 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 the observer. So that is the significance of this uh, project. And uh, hope you enjoyed today's talk. And uh, do ask any any questions if you have. Do put them in the comments. And um, next week we'll also will be back with another exciting topic. Uh, and uh, see you till see you around till then. And have a nice day. Bye.